Hello everyone. I am Li Ying, one of the Healthcare Scholarships Officers with Healthcare Scholarships and Talent. A warm welcome to Healthcare Scholarships Virtual Experience 2021. For some of you who have attended the earlier sections, welcome back and thank you for joining us in this segment. Throughout the two weeks of virtual events ending on 3rd March, you will get the opportunity to participate and interact with scholar ambassadors, scholarship officers, university partners and professional representatives from various public healthcare institutions. We have an ongoing leaderboard and game section for participants to win attractive prizes, such as Universal Studios Singapore One Day Pass, Disney Plus subscriptions, web food vouchers and many more. There are also many ways to earn points, such as by attending programs, asking questions and playing our daily games. Welcome to Learn and Explore Podiatry with the University of South Australia. The University of South Australia is one of the MOHH approved overseas universities to pursue a course in podiatry. In this session, you will hear from guest speakers from the University of South Australia, podiatrists from Singapore's public healthcare institutions, and a current student to learn more about this allied health discipline, the course structure, and student life. Before we begin, if you have any questions for our speakers, please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box. If you would like to direct your question to a specific speaker, please indicate it in your question. Lastly, if you see any questions that you are interested in being answered, please upvote the questions. We will have time for Q&A at the end of this session. Before I hand over the time to Dr. Ryan Cosby, Program Director for Podiatry from the University of South Australia to begin with his presentation, let's take a look at this video. My name is Arena. I'm a podiatrist. I graduated from UniSA in 2007. I've worked full time in podiatry ever since in country Victoria, Tasmania, and now have come home to Adelaide. I always wanted to go into high risk podiatry, particularly after my placement. I think it's an opportunity to make the most impact and give the most back to patients to see someone that the doctors have talked about amputating their foot or amputating a toe and be able to make a difference and potentially delay or prevent that is really amazing. UniSA, one of the things that I loved was we had a very, very small class size and you actually got to know your lecturers and tutors and they got to know you. It was a really lovely place to learn and very, very supportive. I think placements are vital. With podiatry, so much of what you learn happens on the job. I definitely feel like I, I changed and grew as a person. Podiatry is a really diverse and wide ranging profession, so you can do anything from paediatrics through to sports and biomechanics and aged care facilities. Patients that we thought we couldn't help five years ago now are back doing what they want to be doing, playing with their grandkids and not seeing us, which is lovely. It's really, really important that we advocate for what we do and what kind of difference we can make to people. And it's nice to get really enthusiastic, caring, empathetic people into podiatry. I think I'm starting. Okay. Yep, no worries. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'll just share my screen to you. Um, here we go. Hopefully you can see my screen now. Um, yes, my name's Ryan Corsby. I'm the program director of the podiatry program here at the University of South Australia. My story is a little bit like um, uh, arenas where I started um, working in a rural place in country South Australia and then ended up working in a, a big hospital, probably most akin to the hospitals that you have, uh, big podiatry departments in Singapore, uh, such as Changi or Singapore General Hospital. So I worked at the Royal Adelaide Hospital and the Queen Elizabeth Hospitals before coming across to the university. I've now worked at the university for 19 years, so thank goodness for soft focus on the camera. Um, because it feels like it's been uh, been quite a while and it, and it really has been. But 
within that, I've actually got up to being the program director and I've now been in this position for more than six years. Um, so the podiatry program is uh, one of eight programs that exist around Australia. Okay, we're probably one of the longest running programs since uh, we started in 1947. Um, and it's the only program on offer in South Australia. We're based in the School of Allied Health and Human Performance. So we're very much linked in with physios, occupational therapists, medical radiation, um, exercise physiologists and speech pathology departments, okay? To provide a really interprofessional approach to looking at healthcare. And I'm gonna talk a lot about our program, but before I do, I'm just gonna step back a bit. Obviously you've just seen the video of Arena just discussing her work as a high risk podiatrist. Um, and as I said, most akin to what, what I at least know as being one of the primary areas of work for podiatrists in Singapore. But podiatry is more than just that. For some reason my slide's not going. There we go. So just very quickly um, covering a, a bit of background of what is a podiatrist. The Australian Podiatry Council covers it with a definition which it says podiatry deals with the prevention diagnosis, treatment and rehab of conditions of the foot and lower leg, okay? We may do that by medical and surgical means. So in a way, we're kind of your physio, your doctor, your nurse, your dermatologist, um, your orthopedic specialist, all concentrating on the foot and lower leg, okay? So there's a really broad knowledge base that's necessary to be able to work in this area. Um, and so for that reason, there's a lot of areas that podiatrists can work in. As you can see, and as you saw in the video, high-risk feet diabetes is probably our primary um, public health version of podiatry, where we try and work with people with such things as diabetes to prevent them developing wounds, um, ulcerations, and ultimately amputation, okay? To keep them on the feet and keep them working. And it's a really highly rewarding position for that reason. However, it is more than just that. Um, as you can see from here, we work with skin and nail conditions, covering things such as thickened nails, corns and callus, really basic things like old chiropodists used to do, right up to things like plantar warts, diagnosing cancers or ingrown toenails that I'll mention again when we talk about surgery. In addition to that, they work with biomechanics, which is basically the study of locomotion of people, okay, so biological motion of the body. And obviously we can't move around without our legs and feet being a big part of that. So often that leads into various people with have, that have running disorders, problems with um, conditions that, that really affect their ability to walk and just generally trying to manage painful type um, presentations. And there's a whole heap of reasons for that. And we look at the way that the body moves and the way that the muscles, tendons and bones interact to be able to manage that and to be able to then diagnose that and, and treat the condition. You've probably got or even know someone who has some uh, orthotics or foot supports or specialized shoes. And it's that sort of thing that we do. In addition to that, we work with paediatrics and you can see here, we've got two of our students working with children, uh, looking at trying to improve balance and improve their conditions in sort of the clumsy type child condition. But we do work with kids with, for example, club feet or various other uh, conditions such as autism where they might not be able to stand people touching their feet or having tactile type problems or feeling problems. We work with surgery. We do teach basic surgery, so nail surgery here at the university. We work with primary health care, falls prevention, cardiac rehab programs, you name it. And then there's a whole heap of other fields that you can actually work in as a podiatrist that, um, that just may take your fancy once you've kind of decided that none of those areas are for you. One of my friends in my, my year actually went on to work for a shoe company. And their sole job now is to not only promote shoes, but help feed into the design and testing of footwear uh, for that company. So for that reason, you have to understand that you're obviously working with people a lot. You need to be interested in working with people, promoting well-being, have an interest in health and have really good motor and communication skills. So by saying good motor skills, you do need to be able to use a scalpel, be able to um, use a syringe those sort of things and the real fine motor detail that that's required to be able to undertake those things, as well as making your own orthotics, getting on a grinder, 
getting into like almost your back shed and doing things like that. So you do need some good motor skills within that as well. Um, just to expand on that, I, I'm sure that you'll you'll be hearing to people that, from people later on that are now working in Singapore that were our graduates, um, and they'll talk a lot more about particularly the career opportunities that exist in Singapore. But as a whole, there are a whole heap of areas that uh, worldwide that podiatrists can work. Obviously, hospitals being the most recognised, but in addition to that, there are podiatrists now that are working in private practice. Here in South Australia, 65% of our graduates now go into private practice. I know that's slightly different in Singapore, but I'm also aware that that's a growing field. Uh, they work in aged care facilities, these children health services, sports rehab services, and as I've already mentioned, things like footwear companies or even occupational health services. So working with companies that have to have people wearing, say, uh, work boots or on their feet a lot to improve the health and make sure that they don't develop any problems while they're on the work site. Um, I won't provide too much detail of the of the real specifics around the, I guess, the administrative requirements of our program. Um, you'll hear from Hody, who's in our international team a little bit later on about some of the details and particularly around the international application stuff that relates to our program. What I do want to point out is that we are a four year program. It is very much on site and internal. Um, as I'm sure Karen, who's one of our current students, will attest to. Obviously, it's been quite difficult in the times that we know as being COVID because of the real practical aspect of our program. So whilst we're doing our best to try and teach some stuff remotely, uh, there is actually the need to be on site and being involved in current clinics um, as we go through the program. And we'll talk a lot about that. For that reason, we are, as I said, clinical. And you can see here, we actually boast that we provide over a thousand hours of actual clinical experience during the program so that when you graduate, you can hit the ground running as a very, uh, I guess, um, applicable podiatrist and then actually can jump straight into the workplace without too much additional training. And to do that, we have very strong industry links. Okay, we work with a lot of the podiatrists, a lot of the health services. And as I said, we, we do work interprofessionally. So we work with physios, OTs and all that to provide this sort of education. Okay, more about our program. As I said, one of eight around Australia. Despite that, we're still quite an intimate little program, okay? We still have, compared to say physio that have quite high um, student numbers, we have currently around about 200 students, okay? This number that, I've, that you see on screen is underestimating it because we have some students that aren't, that are on leave of absence or um, unfortunately caught uh, out due to the COVID situation. But on our books at the moment, we have roughly 200 students. We have 52 in first year, 45 in second year, 39, and right down to 27 in, in the fourth year there. So for that reason, as Arena alluded to in the video, you really do get to know your own cohorts. You get to know the other students in the, in the years, which makes it quite collegiate. Um, but more importantly, you also get the chance to actually meet us as the staff and we actually get to know you as, as people, not just students. Um, and that really comes out within our program. Um, all right. Uh, I guess now is a good time to mention too, we've got a really long history with international students um, within our program. The, uh, the picture that I've used here, you can see Arnold is talking to you today. He is one of our international students. But throughout our program, we've had students from China, we've had them from Korea, we've had them from the uh, Middle East, um, and uh, obviously we've had quite a few from Singapore, some of whom you'll be hearing from today. Um, being a small program, we do have a fairly small cohort of core staff, and you can see here, this is, this is most of us with me in the middle. Um, roughly, we have six to seven uh, core staff that are involved in as, as academics. Having said that, we are all practicing podiatrists. So we all still keep up with clinical work and we're all very hands-on uh, with patients so that we keep up to date with the actual clinical application of podiatry and not just academics that kind of sprout the evidence without actually putting it into practice. Obviously, there's, as I said, a lot of 
clinical hours and um, despite the fact that we are small, co small cohort, that does rely on a big um, number of, of staff that need to bring in some expertise, for example, around surgery. I'm definitely not the expert when it comes to surgery. I have expertise in other areas, but not just to provide the expertise, but to provide some more input into our program. So we, we uh, rely on about 35 casual staff that will come in and out of the program and teach within certain areas. Um, again, I won't get into the, the entry requirements from an administrative point of view, but from a knowledge point of view, I'd just like to outline the university that doesn't require any prerequisites. So you don't actually have to have studied anything specific to get into our program. However, particularly uh, as you come into the first year, and I'll talk about the structure of our program soon, there is an assumed knowledge, okay, in the areas of biology, chemistry, and physics. Biology, biology, obviously, because we're dealing with the human body, okay? So almost everything we do refers back to that base biological knowledge. Physics really does relate to specifically to the biomechanics that I talked about and being able to study the body's motion and understanding what the muscles, tendons, and bones are actually doing whilst the body's going through that locomotion. So you have to apply a lot of I guess, understanding of physics to that area. And chemistry applies to the various creams, medications, chemicals that we um, either recommend or provide to patients in, in able to manage the condition. So you can come in without actually having studied those areas, but it would be beneficial if you do have a background in those areas, a bit of background, or at least the capacity to be able to gain that knowledge rather quickly when we're actually going into um, in, in straight into the program. We do give basic review of some of the concepts at, at the start of your program, but yes, obviously that having that background would be quite useful. Um, I don't think there's anything else I want to talk to you about that sort of stuff. Let's have a quick look at our degree structure. As I mentioned, it is a four year degree, okay? Um, and we, we basically set it up to start with building a really good knowledge base, okay? Give you a grounding of all the information that you need to have um, and then build upon that year upon year um, and, and putting it into a clinical context. These blue subjects here, okay? Unfortunately, they're not very descriptive about the content that's involved in them, but the blue ones are the ones that are actually working in a clinic hands-on with patients. And as you can see, we start you out in second year but by the time you get to fourth year, almost all the, all the topics are very clinical based, okay? So they are actually hands-on and working as a podiatrist, all right? I'll expand on some of these actual content areas a little bit in a sec. Um, uh, it is four years. We do have some people that take a little bit longer. Um, whilst we don't necessarily provide it as a part-time study option, obviously we do need to cater the program to various needs. So there are certain things that need to be studied hand in hand together. For example, studying communication is really important to be studying whilst you're actually learning to interact with patients and having your first clinical experience. So we actually require those two subjects to be studied together. But that's something that we can talk about if you come into the program. Okay, what do we study in each of the years? So as a program overview, as I said, in first year, they're very much the preparatory courses, okay, giving you a really good sound knowledge. We like to cover the concept of health, what health is, what it means, and how to actually manage health. We also like to cover evidence-based practice. So how do we know what we're doing is the best thing that we're doing? How do you interpret the evidence that's out there? How do you apply it to a clinical situation? So that's sort of two of the courses that you do in first year. Obviously, to be a podiatrist, you need to have that medical knowledge. So this is where we then start to build your basic medical knowledge. And we cover things like human physiology, anatomy, and podiatry clinical studies covers that, um, that basic medical condition type things, covering things like respiratory conditions, endocrine conditions, dermatological conditions at a real basic level. So you understand each of these different topics and how it will apply to the foot and lower leg. 
And finally, we do start to cover the biomechanics stuff. Now we call it introductory biomechanics, but this is where we introduce you to physics. And particularly for those who haven't studied physics, we provide that base knowledge that we're gonna build upon when we get into more, more uh, advanced biomechanics assets. You can see in the background here, this is a picture of, of one of the trips that we do. I'll talk a bit about it later, but basically this was at the Royal Flying Dock Service up in Port Augusta. Um, this was one of the places I used to work when I worked rurally. And we used to cover and provide services out to about 70% of the geographical state of South Australia. Okay, we provided clinics in conjunction with the flying doctors. So with that link, we actually, in one of our trips, we do go and visit the Royal Flying Doctor Service. And these are come with some of our third year students at the time visiting that, that, um, that facility. In second year, we take that base knowledge and we look at introducing it to the clinical context. So as you can see here, we do commence that clinical practice course. Um, and within that, um, you'll be seeing your patient relatively quickly. So by about week six or week seven of second year is when you will actually first have your, your, your first contact with your first real life patient, okay? We do prepare you for that, so don't stress out. We do have extra staff on hand for those first couple of clinics, uh, just to make sure you don't get in any trouble. Um, in addition to that, and the other area we start to build upon things is pharmacology. This is a really big push in podiatry at the moment. In Australia, we are now uh, can become endorsed prescribers of medications. Um, and, and independent of that, we have to have a good knowledge of the pharmacological stuff that, or the, the medications that people are on and how it affects the body. So in second year, we have the equivalent of four subjects that are related to pharmacology. And that's building upon the physiology that we introduce you to in first year. And then we start to get into the advanced biomechanics. So you can see here, this is Kate, one of our last students, doing some very basic nail type um, management of what, what you will typically see in a second year clinic. So unfortunately, you're not yet saving people's toes from amputation. You're not trying to um, help them get over massive wounds or, or solving their big uh, running issue because they're you know, an elite runner that needs to get to the Olympics. But we start you at basic level, looking at skin and nail conditions and how to manage those sort of things. By third year, we build upon that, okay? So we start to introduce you to surgical practice. These are our students actually learning to give an anaesthetic. As I said, we're a pretty hands-on course. You do, uh, obviously you can actually say if you don't want to, but you do get to practice giving an anaesthetic on each other, okay? It's nothing quite like understanding what it's like to give, uh, to receive an anaesthetic to, to being able to actually go in and give it to somebody else as well. This is where we also cover rural health and, and sort of those high needs, so high need groups in the form of, um, you know, low socioeconomic areas, um, really um, poor health status um, and, and those sort of things. So, and we do that with a trip up into the rural areas, which is the picture that I showed you before. Getting to advanced biomechanics, we teach you some of the advanced pain management type um, I guess evidence that's out there now. We have a very specialist research area here at the podiatrist looking at pain management. And then finally, as I said, by the time you get to fourth year, um, by the time you get to fourth year, then we start to get you into the real specialist area of podiatry. Okay, so things like pediatrics, you've already seen this photo. We get you into doing sports injury clinics, okay? fitting your own orthotics. This is one that Adam and actually made for this patient. The patient looks way too happy about it. Normally they're kind of a little bit more reserved about it. So obviously this is a staged photo. Um, and we actually provide surgery clinics to real life patients, okay? So by the time you've finished the fourth year, you would have given an anesthetic at least once. You would have actually provided the, the post-operative care at least once, and you would have actually done the surgery at least once on a real patient before you actually graduate. We provide hospital placements and rural placements. In the final year, we don't actually work on your typical semesters with a mid-semester break. We work on six week rotations in which you will be guaranteed that you have to do a hospital placement. You might be doing a rural placement as well. And then you work in each of these clinics within the thing on a rotational basis. Okay, this picture up here is taken in a country called Kiribati and I'll talk a little bit more about some of the additional op placement opportunities that we have um, uh, as you go through the program. 
I might just backtrack to and point out that in uh, third year, when we do introduce you to see that some of these advanced clinical type courses, we work quite closely with some of the other, um, I guess, healthcare services to provide you a really diverse experience. So this is where we work with aged care facilities. We work with Diabetes Australia, and we work with the Salvation Army to provide um, uh, health, I guess, foot care to those in need as well. So we do have some quite uh, unique experiences. And we also start to try and um, provide services out to Broken Hill in Australia, um, where we go out for a week long for students, two tutors, and actually provide this, the clinical services to these communities. Okay, how do we provide all this? So I'll talk a bit about those extra opportunities, but part of the clinical courses means that we have to be able to provide our own, um, I guess, health services and we provide that to the public. As you can see here, within a year, so between 2000, middle of 2019 and the middle of 2020, okay, so that includes the start of COVID, we provided over 2000 patients with almost 7,000 appointments through our, our just our university run metropolitan clinics. We run three metropolitan clinics, one here where I'm based at the City East campus, um, I'm sure the uh, graduates will talk a bit about that. Obviously, that's where they spent most of their time over the four years that they were with us. Um, we also now run a university clinic up in a rural area that's linked in with a, with a um, university campus up in Wyala. We run some additional community clinics that are some of which I've mentioned. And even on the odd occasion, we take this little bus here, we call our mobile clinic, and we go out to some different areas when, when the opportunity arises and provide some services out there. And finally, the, the super, you know, cream on the, on the top of the cake experience that you don't get, I, I'll be honest, in almost any other program, at least around Australia, is these extra outreach opportunities. So Broken Hill I've already mentioned, but we travel up to the Aboriginal communities and spend week long visits up providing services in the Aboriginal communities and a country called Kiribati that sits within the Pacific Ocean. Okay, and we go for a two, long, two week long visit there. And I've got some pictures to show you later, just to show you the, the experience that they have out there. So this was a, one of the Broken Hill trips. This is within our clinic in the university. And these are the, just the students having a bit of fun. So I threw that, that photo in there as well. All right. Just no, nothing else coming up on the chat. So as I said, a different experience, and this is the thing. So this is providing services just out in the middle of nowhere. Um, Kiribati is a small island, probably only has about 3000 population over the entire country. Um, and this is the police services. So we were starting to provide service there. You can't quite see easily, but this poor guy was missing his toe. Doesn't make it easy to, to track down and, and run down and all those criminals that they have on the island, not all of them, but some of the island. So we, we've gone in and tried to help him with a special orthotic and just to try and prevent further problems across the other part of his foot there. So this was uh, one of our final year students from uh, not last year, but the year before, so 2019. Obviously 2020, we didn't really get to go to Kiribati too much because of the COVID pandemic. This is providing some of the services in the Aboriginal communities. And this little tool here is just to be able to, for us to be able to listen to the uh, quality of the blood flow to the foot. Okay, so it enables us to actually do a proper measure of that blood flow and provide that back. Um, all right, cool. Uh, all right, sorry, just monitoring the chat as I go. Let's go back there. Uh, this is some of the training we provided to nurses in Kiribati. As you can see, they have some quite cute little uniforms there and everything else. Um, and this is, as you can see, quite a uh, quite an islander type community, okay, and quite a humid setting. So that was us gathering after we'd done a training session. These are some of the rooms and facilities that we worked in. Very different sort of circumstance to what you'd probably see and what you'll hear about with the next speakers with their work in, in the larger hospitals and tertiary care hospitals in Singapore. Um, our students do get a little bit active as well and we encourage things. We have a student conference that we now run every year. Okay, so this was the student conference from two years ago. Um, we also get involved in primary health care activities and various um, displays promoting health to the community. 
and our new, I guess, approach to particularly uh, teaching wound care and things that are a little bit more um, exhausting is 3D printed feet. Okay, so every student gets their own 3D foot model to be able to practice and learn on. So in this one, they're actually learning to do wound care management. And that, that is a 3D printed foot with a, an exposed tendon within that. Um, some of our orthotic workshops, so these are ankle foot orthotics and, and looking at offloading the foot, okay, for somebody who has diabetes and we need to get them healed up as a desperate measure before they actually do have a breakdown and end up with an amputation. So this is one of our last line sort of management type principles and this is learning how to put on orthotics. So you get to do that, walk around and see how good or bad you are at making those devices. Trust me, if you do it badly, it gets really uncomfortable really quickly. Okay, before I go on too much further, we do have a very quick look at the facilities that we've got here. Unfortunately, um, let's see, it should come straight up onto the screen. So this is uh, our City East campus, okay? And you can see here, this is the plaza area. Coffee shop just in there, trust me, you'll spend a lot of time or a lot of money, unfortunately, buying coffees there. Our clinic is based in the bottom level of this building here, okay? So this is the centenary building. Um, what we will show you though, because you obviously don't want to just know where you're going to sit and have lunch, but let's have a quick look. So as I said, we, you will be studying anatomy in first year. These are our anatomy clinics with lots of uh, various anatomical models and we use um, uh, 3D sort of uh, anatomy software as well to, to also supplement that, but we do like to get hands on with the models there. Um, in addition to that, there's nothing quite like touching the real thing. So as much as it may gross you out, and obviously in our videos we don't have that, but you can see these trolleys here. We normally have um, real life, no, not life, but we have pro-sections of deceased um, bodies that we use to be able to help facilitate your learning in anatomy. Okay, so that's a very technical way of saying we do actually have legs and feet that were once somebody, unfortunately, that was alive and who had donated their, their body to this cause. Um, and it is a really great way to learn. Um, unfortunately, there's still, um, this still can't be, I guess, replaced by uh, online software or anything like that. There's nothing quite like seeing and feeling how a nerve really does sit within a, a certain structure within the body. So in addition to the anatomy labs, you can see this is just a, a very, very empty room. Normally when we have the pro sections, it was a little bit more entertaining, but we can't put that in a, in a um, public setting. Um, in our podiatry clinics, so this is our City East clinic. You can see we're looking out almost to where the plaza is there. This is one of our treatment rooms, okay? So we have um, uh, electronic files. So everybody uses laptops now. You can see here the patient will come in. We can actually use those doors for them to uh, take off their shoes, sit down, and, and we'll actually provide treatment there. Uh, in the hallway, you can see just this, this is where you grab your supplies from and so on and so forth. So it's a very, um, I guess, a, a unique little setting. There's roughly uh, 17 rooms available to us in this clinic. In our City West clinic, we have around about eight rooms available to us at any one time. And in addition to that, um, there's also collated with medical services, physio services and OT services. So that's our real interprofessional type clinic there. Um, as I said, we'll teach you how to manage a clinic. So this is just our sterilization room. You learn how to sterilize your own instruments and to, to sort of, I guess, manage that side of it. So that, that clinical management side of it. In a hospital, for, of course, the hospitals would obviously do that, as, that for you. But if you're in a private practice setting, then you need to be able to do everything yourself. So we do make sure you come out with that knowledge. Um, as we lead through here, so we're going from a treatment room through to the sterilization room, just down this end here, you'll be able to see, this is where we actually do the surgeries. So obviously we don't have transparent glass. We don't want people being able to see in what exactly what we're doing here. We have, uh, you know, touch-free taps and, and obviously, appropriate ways of doing a scrub down um, to set up for a surgical type process. And this is a really large room so that we can actually have the appropriate amount of people in here to be able to observe and to be able to participate in the surgery that we're providing. Um, 
The other thing from our facilities perspective, obviously uh, you need to be able to learn to make your own orthotics. We have entered the, the 21st century and we do also use iPad scanners and those get sent off to a lab for 3D printing um, of an orthotic type device. Okay, so an arch support device, but we, we like to teach you the basics, okay, how to do it manually with your hands using good old fashioned plaster and plastic. So this is our wet area. You can see multiple sinks for students to be able to all be lined up. You can see various devices laying around where they've actually gone in and actually manipulated the plaster to try and create what they want. So these are some of the moulds and as you can see, some of the plastic that's being put on there. You can see through here into our grinding room because once you've actually done the plaster work, that's going to be able to, I guess, act as the, the mould for what the plastic can be moulded to, to make the orthotic. We then need to be able to actually press that. Unfortunately, we haven't done have a picture of that, but then we need to be able to grind it into the shape that we need so it can actually fit into the footwear. Okay, so as I said, you do need some good manual skills around that. All right, back to my presentation quickly. There we go. Um, so that was a very quick tour of some of our facilities there. Okay, as they keep saying, that's a really big important part of our program. Um, unlike some of the other programs that all the teaching clinically happens off site or in another hospital, the fact that we run our own public clinics is actually a really important part of our program. We have much better control over the patients and the type of patients that you get to see. Um, and all under the supervision, obviously, of practicing podiatrists. Uh, finally, to let you know within our program, we also run an honor stream. Um, and so with the, at the end of second year um, for uh, uh, high achieving students, they have the ability to um, uh, apply an expression of interest uh, for our honours program. If you do go into the honours program, then that commences at the start of third year and your program gets manipulated a bit so you can actually go in, develop your own primary research project. Okay, so you do a review of the literature, get, a re get the best understanding of what's happening in the area and come up with a proposal for a research project under the supervision of usually two to three um, of the academic or, or other podiatry type staff. Those two or three, we, we are solely there to guide you. We have regular meetings every once to two, one to two weeks. And within those meetings, obviously you get to know us very well, but we make sure that your needs are being met as far as getting the understanding that you need. The ultimate outcome of course, is to then present that, um, that project at a conference uh, possibly an international or at least a national conference and to get a journal publication out of it. Hopefully I'm not stealing poor Arnold's thunder. He'll be talking to you later on. I, of course, was one of the supervisors on this project, but Arnold was did very well with his honours and came out um, presenting uh, with a publication in Forensic Science International. Part of the reason that we, uh, we did the, uh, the project in forensics is myself. Uh, here and uh, Associate Professor Sarah Jones also work as consultant um, forensic podiatrist for some of the police services around Australia. And where the opportunity is, we also get you guys involved or at least let you know what we do as part of that forensic type process. So another kind of spin on what we can offer within our program. All right, I'm almost there. Um, I will be available to you. Um, for any questions that you may have uh, when it comes to the panel discussion. Um, this was our last year group. They, they persevered, they did really well. Obviously this is their class photo. They had, they endured the pandemic in the real way. Um, you know, we, we recommenced our clinics here in South Australia at the beginning of June. And we managed them in such the way that they were, that were, they were not at any high, high risk, but obviously had to can continue on through that pandemic. And we got them there in the end. They are now graduated and I reckon 95% of them currently have jobs. So we're super proud of that. Now we've just got to work on the uh, second and third years to get them up to speed as well within the pandemic times. Um, so yeah, happy to answer any questions you have um, either through the, the chat sort of function, but also I'll be available in the panel session. 
feel free to follow our Instagram page. It's just a bit of fun so the students can see what's coming up, what they've got happening, and, and we get to kind of showcase them in a, in a lovely sort of uh, a visual means. So at podiatry underscore UniSA. We do run a Facebook page, but I guess that's more focused on the clinic and being able to provide clinical services. So if you really want to see what's happening and, and get onto it, by all means, join us at, at Podiatry UniSA. Thank you very much for your time. Um, I hope to see some of you in the flesh when our borders reopen and if you have an interest in podiatry. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ryan, for sharing, sharing more about the University of South Australia, details of the podiatry course and giving us a glimpse of the campus facilities. Next, no, I'd like to... You. Yep, thank you, Dr. Ryan. Yep. Next, I would like to invite the following speakers, a current student and two podiatrists from our public health care institutions to do a sharing. First, we have Karen Wei, a current student at the University of South Australia. Next, Arno Fu, senior podiatrist from Ng Teng Fong General Hospital and Mirabel Heng, Principal Podiatrist from Singapore General Hospital. Karen, please. Hello. Okay, I will share my screen. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Karen and I'm currently a Year 3 Podiatry student in UniSA. Um, I will be presenting together with Arno and Maribel, as mentioned, and yeah, so I'll just get straight to it. Here is a quick overview of what a typical day looks like as a uni essay student. I hope that by sharing all this, um, it will make you excited for university. So I'll wake up for a morning lecture, and uni is only a 10-minute walk away from home because the health science campus is in the city, which is great. Um, and then I begin class, lectures, tutorials, lab sessions. The lessons are often very enjoyable because of how supportive the teaching staff are in UniSA. And UniSA also has a great campus facil facilities. So for example, I love the lecture halls with multiple screens um, so that it's not only in the front, but also in the middle. So people at the back can see the screens clearly as well. Um, the wet labs, like um, Ryan mentioned, are supplied with new samples from the uni next door as well. We've got our computer barns, our beautiful libraries, etc. And in between classes, we often get our study breaks, which we, we like to spend in the cafeteria or the library. But the latter is more convenient when it's um, exam season. And it's um, a really good environment for conducive study. When we need a change of environment, the uni is conveniently situated right next to the state library, which is the absolute best. And this is definitely one of my favorite study spots. And then lunch. So microwaving my meal prep at the cafeteria is the norm and also for all international students. But on days we want to treat ourselves, my friends and I would cross the road here, um, as you can see on this street. Um, so when you cross the street, you'll get to the East Side cafes and sometimes uni students get to redeem a free coffee at Centurus or something there. So there are a lot of student perks um, for uni students in Adelaide. Um, and then back to more classes for the afternoon. Some days are shorter, which may end after one afternoon class or um, other days are longer. But I don't really complain on those days because the view on the way home is amazing. Um, so the part about having a campus in the city is that the environment is very nice and it does give a good tone to your day. Um, so after uni, I join my friends at the bouldering gym for a good sweat session. So uni essay has an exciting array of clubs, um, but I chose to join the rock climbing one. From there, I met a wonderful community of climbers, which ended up climbing more than the official training on Tuesdays. And often we even climb until it's dark. So after that, we end up at Chinatown for dinner where the only shops left open are. Um, dinner plans are often very exciting because we international students love to experiment with our food in the communal kitchen. And on colder nights, we stack on our sweaters and go and grab a warm supper as well. After the long day, I meal prep for the next few meals and then also call home. So something about the time zone difference between Singapore and Adelaide is that it's only 1.5 or 2.5 hours difference, um, depending on whether there's daylight savings. So sometimes when I finish my day at maybe 10 p.m., when I call back, um, my family has just finished their dinner um, at 8.30, so then that actually works out really well for us. Okay, so at this point, uh, we also thought it would be helpful to give a general idea of what living costs will be like in Adelaide. 
So of course, spending varies from person to person, and this is just my own experience, but it may be a practical help for you guys to know. Um, one thing to note is that the first one or two months of arriving in Australia will definitely include more spending because of setup costs, like um, getting weather appropriate clothing, etc. Um, but as you can see, so I have um, screenshotted my spending Excel sheets just for reference. Um, as you can see, uh, after a few months, your spending will likely stabilize um, at like a lower level. For me, I found a rough approximate of spending about four to five hundred dollars quite manageable. Um, so rent usually takes up about half of the stipend that MOHH provided when I was living at student accounts. So the most first year stay in student accommodation as a safe choice. Uh, UniSA has a collaboration with one called Urbanest. So if you want to search it up, it's U-R-B-A-N-E-S-T. Um, and this is actually where I stayed in my first year as well. Uh, after getting used to the city, it's not uncommon for students to move out with some friends and find other apartments on the market to save rent. Um, besides rent, the main living costs include phone bills, groceries, um, eating out, and transport. Adelaide has a free tram around the city and in the city, but buses and trains outside the city. Um, we use the Adelaide Metro card, uh, which is the equivalent of the Singaporean easing card. And I usually end up topping up my Metro card about just $20 a month. This might be a bit low for some people, but um, actually staying within the city is very convenient. There's not too much reason to have to travel out. Um, and eating out is rather expensive. So cooking meals at home is a good way to save money. If you like your Asian cuisine, you will be glad to know that there is a lot of Korean, um, Chinese and Vietnamese food around. And yes, also Malaysian and Singaporean food. Um, but don't expect your 3 to $4 chicken rice. No, no, no. It will be about... 12 or $15. So to save your wallet, sitting in the kitchen would be wise. That being said, cooking is not always the setup option just to save money, but it's also fun to, have, uh, fun to have friends over and to make a meal together. I must say, in the recent few years, Adelaide has grown a lot in terms of food options. Um, so I've heard from seniors like Arnold, who is also here today, there used to be really few bubble tea stores around, but by the time I got there, um, bubble tea shops are everywhere. There's even Fong Cha there um, and Yifa. So um, self-control was definitely a good personality trait to train there. Um, but honestly, wherever you are, budgeting is always a matter of um, balancing prudence and also spending on experiences. So like renting a car to road trip or getting tickets to catch a football game are likely things you would want to do on a weekend. But um, so budgeting would be good for that. Um, but if uh, for those of you actually who are into sports, part of your spending may go into paying for competitions or equipment. Adelaide has a really good sporting community. So um, that is something to take note of. For me, it was gym passes to go to rock climbing, which ended up about 100 a month. So that was something I had to budget for. Okay, um, I hope that listening to all this money talk hasn't stressed you guys out because MLHH actually does provide a really good um, amount of living expense, um, which is paid out six monthly, uh, and it comfortably co covered everything I mentioned in my experience. So um, firstly, there's a lot to be thankful for, for MLHH scholars like myself. And secondly, it's also a good chance to learn how to manage my own finances. Also, I'd like to share some useful nuggets of information. Um, it's good to know that um, UniSA actually provides um, printing credits of about $100 for full-time students. So printing costs was actually never something I had to worry about. When I talked to my friends from other uni, um, they had to pay for their own printing, but um, I'm really glad that UniSA covered a big part of that. Um, the uni also has a good research department that um, sometimes gives remuneration for students who are willing to take part in surveys. So for international students, if you look out for those, it's something you and your uni friends could do together and go out for a nice meal um, with that voucher afterwards. Um, and finally, another useful fact to know is that um, actually if you study late in a uni essay library and it gets dark, you can walk to a security office and ask for a uni car to drive you home within the city. And this is especially helpful if you don't feel safe for any reason walking home that night. Um, so they charter cars to drive students home hourly from 7 p.m. to 1 a.m. I hope I've been able to share some useful information about the uni experience at, at UniSA and also living in Adelaide. Um, now I should um, share more about the academic front. 
So in first year, um, we covered general anatomy and physiology across both semesters, and Ryan has already gone through most of this, but um, I'd just like to direct your attention to the right um, with the arrows. So in second year, we are introduced to pharmacology, um, but um, the subjects with the arrows are those that will take place in a clinic that the uni actually has. Um, for the subject that has the green arrow, um, Podiatry Clinical Studies 200, um, this subject was actually really challenging to conduct when COVID-19 hit a few weeks into the semester. But nonetheless, UniSA was able to speedily transition all its students into an online platform of learning. And I was actually the only international student called back to my home country. Even then, special effort was constantly being made for me to keep up, keep up with lessons and assessments. Um, so Helen Benwell here, this lady, um, she's my lecturer and she made sure to mail clinical instruments all the way from Adelaide to my home address in Singapore for me to practice um, clinical skills over Zoom. And I also had the help of Maribel here, who is also here today, um, who reached out and offered her own disposable scalpels for my practice. This was definitely a period where I felt really supported amidst the frenzy of the pandemic. Um, end of last semester, I carried on with my virtual um, clinical exam um, with the support of seniors like Maribel and UniSA staff. And it was definitely a one-of-a-kind experience um, taking an exam online. Um, and also I had my shot at stardom because UniSA Podiatry featured me. Thank you very much. Um, right now, the borders to Australia has not been open, but there are some clinical modules that I unfortunately have to defer. And as such, my graduation will be delayed by a year. But nonetheless, I will be continuing uh, remotely with all the non-clinical modules this coming semester. Um, and Ryan Cosby, as you, um, who you've met, um, my course coordinator, has been so helpful and patient um, to read. And he even took the time to rethink the entire timeline of my course in this unique situation I'm facing. And the pandemic struck really swiftly and very harshly. But I'm very, very grateful and honestly very impressed as well with the student support that UniSA has been able to has been able to provide me. Um, and also, before I pass the time to Arnold, I was lightening a not so subtle advertisement for UniSA Singapore Students Association, which comprises Singaporean students studying any course in UniSA. Um, we meet for fun things like strawberry picking or um, hanging out at someone's house, which is really nice to join um, when you're in a foreign country away from home. This year is a unique situation where half of us um, is here in Singapore and half of us are in Adelaide. So we've been organizing two-part gatherings for each half, one here and one there. And you guys are welcome to join if you are interested. Our Facebook group is private, but our Instagram has just been set up and it is um, public. So um, feel free to screenshot this slide and search us up on Instagram later. If you drop us a DM on Instagram, I will be happy to get in touch with you and answer any more questions you may have. Um, and also, um, another community you may be interested to join is the Singapore Healthcare Society, also known as SHS for short. Um, it is led by um, a bunch of uh, MOHH scholars in the committee, and SHS is a really good way to get to know other Singaporeans who, be, who will be working in the allied healthcare sector. All MOHH scholars are automatically included in SHS, but non-scholars are also welcome to join. Pre-COVID, there used to be a lot more large gatherings, uh, naturally, but now the nature of support we give is more COVID safe. Uh, so um, there is distributing and grab, grab vouchers to scholars um, as a welfare pack. Um, and also there are online lessons to learn dialect, which will come in helpful when you start work. Um, and this is definitely a good community to be part of. And I personally met many good friends from other professions here as well. Okay, so that's all from me from now, and I'll pass the time over to Arnold. Hi everyone, my name is Arno and I'm just going to start my slide. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, so thank you, Kieran, for sharing your experience in Adelaide. Well, I'm currently uh, practicing as a podiatrist in Jurong Health Campus, uh, part of the NUHS network, which is at the western side of Singapore, uh, comprising of, of Ng Teng Fong General Hospital and Jurong Community Hospital. And I'm also the current vice president of the Podiatry Association of Singapore. And the president of the association is also, will be presenting later, and that's Maribel. And for me, I went over to Adelaide in 2014 
and I graduated at the end of 2017. So I remember Adelaide as one of my best time of my life, to be honest. Uh, the four years there have been very, very memorable. Uh, and I, I was the only Singaporean student uh, back in back in my cohort and our cohort was, and the picture on the right, you can see uh, it's a cohort of approximately 30 of us. So a small cohort. And yes, we are supported by a very uh, supportive group of staff members. Sorry about that. And I know some people are a bit concerned in a sense that how many Singaporeans are going over to Adelaide and like how many Singaporeans you'll meet over, your, over there. Uh, but honestly, uh, do not be afraid to step out of your comfort zone. I made really good friends over there, uh, be it Asians or international students. So don't worry about that. And I also met uh, other Singaporeans in Adelaide as well. So I would like to share a little bit more about the city. Uh, the city is literally a square. In, in the, so from one end to the other end, it takes uh, really quickly. I think uh, it's around 10 to 15 minutes by car. And there's a free tram that goes across the city as well. So uh, the good thing is that the uni is right smack in the city. So whatever you need, you, you can live in the city. Uh, so you can see from this map that the uni is at the top of the city. And the, the triangles were the accommodations that I stayed. So uh, you can literally live like five, 10 minutes away from the uni. So it's really convenient. And uh, I, I know for the, the, back in my time, I don't know about now, but back in my time, there wasn't like a, a accommodation that was owned by the university. So it's unlike your, like your local universities in Singapore, like NUS, NTU, we don't have halls. So you kind of have to look for your own private accommodation. So yes, uh, like Karen, I stayed in Urbanest. So that's a suggestion that you can have a look if you are thinking of studying in Adelaide. So I would like to touch on my personal learning journey in UniSA. So I think I gained a lot of skills and experience in uni from the weekly student clinics that uh, Ryan also mentioned. So in second year, we start off with uh, the general podiatry clinic where we see general skin and nail conditions. Uh, and then in the third and fourth year, we move on to the more advanced podiatry uh, more advanced aspects of podiatry, such as your musculoskeletal biomechanics clinic, where you see like sports injuries, where you fabricate your own orthotics. And then we also uh, see children. So part of the pediatric clinic and, and the nail surgery clinic as well. So yes, we do get to do uh, nail surgery on real patients. And uh, yes, I did manage to operate on uh, one or two patients and did administer local anesthesia for quite a number as well. So the good thing is that these student clinics are not only in uh, one campus. They are, for personally, I went to three different campuses. So two in the city and one a little bit outside the city. So I guess that changes your, uh, your routine. So that's pretty interesting, which, were, which I, I, I found. So apart from the university ran clinics, we also got a chance to went out to many different uh, different settings to practice podiatry under supervision. So there's uh, the hospitals, uh, both at the metropolitan and rural settings. So for example, I also managed to practice uh, at Royal Adelaide Hospital. And I also got to spend a month at uh, Wyala Hospital, which was approximately four or five hours drive away from Adelaide. And we also got to observe uh, at private clinics. So for personally, I managed to get to observe a podiatric surgeon. So a podiatric surgeon isn't a podiatrist, but it's closely related. So the difference is that they get to perform more invasive surgeries compared to us. And also I got the chance to go to Port Lincoln with Ryan, which was around, which is a seven hours drive, but we managed to take a, in like a small little plane to go to Port Lincoln to actually have a one week placement over there. And yeah, as you can see, there's a dolphin that we actually saw 
Uh, but this was in Wyala, where I spent the a month over there. So I think the good thing is that with as a student, with me managing to be able to uh, like practice to be a podiatrist, uh, I can actually see patients from eight to five for a month. I think that really uh, provided me with skills to be able to bring to the workplace in Singapore when I graduate. Uh, so as mentioned by Ryan, I actually got to do the honors program. So I managed to embark on a two-year research program with uh, very, very supportive supervisors. And they actually really uh, supported me and imparted to me a lot of good research skills. So I decided to research on forensic podiatry because I found it pretty interesting because uh, it's something that I didn't know exists before uh, thinking of doing podiatry. So actually what I did was that we actually compared footprints formed in the sh in shoes compared to barefoot footprints to see whether we can identify uh, individuals based on footprint analysis. So basically uh, at the photo at the right, we take measurements of your footprint to see whether they match up with one another. And at the end of the, my two-year program, I'm quite blessed to be able to publish an article in a peer-reviewed journal. So like what Kiran actually mentioned, uh, apart from uni life, there's more to studying. So I, I was the vice president back then for Singapore Healthcare Society. So in Adelaide, there's not only, there's other universities as well with other Singaporeans doing other allied health profession, uh, professions. So you can have the chance to interact with them. And I think back then in my time, we have a year, we have at least three or four events with one being like a sports event, one being like a, we meet up in a nice restaurant where we eat. And sometimes the staff from MOHH will actually come down to interact with us. And then I also had the chance to actually do an overseas CIP trip with other MOHH scholars. And we actually ran mobile clinics in Sri Lanka. And, and I also got the chance to attend actually several conferences and workshops. So I actually went for a Diabetic Food Australia conference where we learned more about the high-risk food in uh, Brisbane. And I also got the chance to fly all the way to um, the United States, uh, Atlanta, to participate in a conference. Uh, it, it was an international diabetes conference. So I actually spent a week over there in the US to actually learn more about uh, diabetes and how it relates to the food. And yes, I was also, also part of the Singapore Student Association and I was the president back then as well. And uh, back then it wasn't as huge as what you have now in, in Karan's time. So we actually, back then I had to organize a, a dinner and dance because it was SG50. And I think at, at that year it was quite memorable because there was more than SG50 because our late founding father Lee Kuan Yew actually passed away. So I also had to organize like a memorable me memorial event for all Singaporeans living in South Australia back then. And I was also heavily involved in volleyball and I was very glad to actually uh, I represent the university in, uh, in the South, South Australian Volleyball League. And I'm pleased to, uh, pleased to say that we actually came in champions back then. So moving on to my career in Jurong Health. So like I mentioned, we have Ng Fong General Hospital and Jurong Community Hospital. So it comprises of both acute and community hospital. We are a small team of 11 podiatrists and four therapy assistants. So we, what we do every day in the hospital is we have either an inpatient or outpatient setting in a sense that we either go work in the wards or we actually run clinics. So we also do community care where we send podiatrists to nursing homes and primary health care settings. So actually like NUHS, we have a partnership with, uh, we have a primary care network where we work with GPs. So we actually send a podiatrist to a GP clinic as well to see their patients. And I would say the main bulk of our work in Singapore would be dealing with diabetic food ulcers. Uh, I would love to show photos of diabetic food ulcers, but I don't think it's a very 
good thing. It's quite gory at times, but so that's why I'm not showing it today. And apart from diabetic foot ulcers, we also deal with sports podiatry. So we deal with footwear, we deal with insoles, we deal with orthotics. So more of the feet related pain due to uh, movement or sports. And of course, the basic, the, our bread and butter, the general podiatry, which is nail and skin conditions. So I would say personally for myself, the most job satisfaction I'm getting now, it will be preventing amputation of the lower limb. Um, currently, Singapore is facing a war against diabetes because um, when, it, when patients have diabetes, they actually, it affects them systematically in the sense their whole body, they get different complications. And one of the most common complication would be foot problems. Uh, due to diabetes, they get impaired blood flow, they get impaired neurological sensation. So they actually are at a higher risk of uh, getting foot ulcers. So our job here is to actually ideally prevent them. But if let's say patients do sustain them, our job here is to manage the wound, provide appropriate offloading treatments such as the orthotic to actually close up that wound. So it, it provides me with a lot of satisfaction when I'm able to actually close up these wounds and heal, heal them up so then they can go back to their daily lives. So like, Ryan said, like what Ryan said, uh, personally, back then in uni, I struggled a lot with the motor work in the sense that I, I was, I had difficulty grinding, but that's all right. With, it all comes with practice. So it, I'm glad that the uni essay actually allowed us to do a lot of practicing due to the availability of the resources and that grinder room. So when it comes to hands-on work, we do a lot with the scalpels and uh, nail clippers, so that those fine motor skills are definitely very important in our daily lives. So this is a, so when it comes to customized food orthotics, we do fabricate them for our patients. So this is an infographic produced by our association of Singapore, our podiatry association of Singapore. So there is, um, there is a lot more to food orthosis than, than you see what you see out there in the, in the shopping malls and that kind of, that kind of stuff. So if you'd like to know more, you can actually check us out on Facebook to look at this infographic as well. So with the research background I had in uni, it actually sparked a, uh, my interest again in back in Singapore. So I managed to publish a few more researchers, a, a few more research projects in Singapore. And I'm currently trying to spearhead even more projects back in my department. So currently we are looking to compare the effectiveness of simple offloading devices on the page, on the feet of people and also compare like simple tests. So um, on the left, it's uh, we do have simple tests to test for the sensation on the feet of patients with diabetes. So one of my projects currently now is to actually compare them to see whether the results of each study uh, of each test will actually correlate to one another. So uh, apart from clinical work, we actually can do research. And I think Maribel will touch on in her part of her presentation. So I'll pass on the time to Maribel now to share with her about her career development. Thanks, Anu. Okay, let me just put up the screen share. Okay, that looks good. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. I hope you are enjoying the session. Um, I'm getting a lot of feels from this session because um, it's great to be hearing from uh, Ryan, who is uh, uh, one of my previous lecturers, and hearing from um, my juniors who have um, gone through a similar journey with me, uh, recollecting and sharing their Adelaide experience. Um, yeah, it really brings back a lot of feels. I, I would, I would encourage everyone to at least visit Adelaide, even if you're not intending to study there or you end, end up in somewhere else. But 
certainly do consider uni as a i really think it's um it gave me a great start and i'll share more about it so um in my segment, I'll be taking you through my research journey and career development. Um, and I'll also show you some of uh, my uni pictures at the end, just to reminisce this, um, this uh, great um, experience about 12 to 15 years ago. So I'm from, uh, I'm a uni SA alumni, class of 2008, for Tree. Um, so currently, uh, I'm based in Singapore General Hospital, and uh, as some of you may know, it's an umbrella under Sing Health. Um, and um, the good thing about being a being under a bigger umbrella is that you do get more opportunities um, to contribute in different ways. So, um, in my own example, uh, I have more opportunities to contribute to research and education through the Sing Health um, Institutes and academies um, and a lot more opportunities to present and teach in local seminars and conferences. Um, I'm also an adjunct lecturer at the UniSA at the moment and I'm supervising a final year student um, in his honours project. Um, so um, I'm the president of the Podiatry Association Singapore and what we do at um, the association is to look at the professional development needs uh, of, the, of, of the nation as a whole. Uh, I also have a role um, in the Chief Allied Health Officer's Office in the Ministry of Health. So in that office, we develop frameworks and how allied health services uh, should be accessed in Singapore. So uh, over the years, uh, the, the opportunities that I had um, gave me, uh, allowed me to develop this multi-portfolio, uh, but it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, there are many um, colleagues who have remained purely on the clinical track, and that's a great career route as well. So for me, uh, my story to put the, to, sorry, my story to podiatry began with ballet. I was pursuing ballet uh, quite seriously from childhood to about uh, early 20s. And uh, some of you might uh, know or can imagine that going on point is very uh, demanding biomechanically as well as uh, a lot of pressure on the toes. So uh, with, my, with my ballet um, training, I actually experienced a lot of injuries to my foot and ankle. And uh, at one point, um, pardon my gory details, but um, my toenail actually uh, uh, split and it plunged into my flesh. And that was where I was introduced to podiatry because my ballet teacher actually recommended me to see a podiatrist to get that sorted. So, um, and that was the first time I came across, uh, you know, this profession known as podiatry. And I remember that the experience uh, definitely left an impression. Um, the podiatrist was very gently picking out all the broken nail pieces in my flesh. And uh, over a few uh, review sessions, uh, the podiatrist helped me on my healing journey that left an impression. Uh, so from a ballerina, um, being on my feet a lot, um, I went into podiatry and um, learned about the biomechanics of the foot uh, and how it worked. And to me, it clicked very well because um, I, first I experienced it firsthand as I used my feet in ballet, and then I learned it uh, through the podiatry course. So I really enjoyed um, kind of like linking the experiences up and now um, um, expressing it through my career. Sorry, let me just have a look. Okay, yeah. So um, I work in SGH as mentioned, it's the Central Acute Hospital with more than a thousand beds. So that gives you a rough idea about the, the size of our patient load. Um, we have about 15 podiatrists in my team. I work in a team of 15 podiatrists, and my work is uh, mainly based around uh, biomechanics page patients, which include um, cases such as foot pain, flat foot, bunions, um, definitely ingrown nails. 
um, a lot of my patients are referred from the orthopedic surgeons. So they may have um, just had a bunion surgery even, and uh, post-operatively, um, the surgeons would refer the patients to podiatry for post-operative care and the prevention of recurrence. So after they've had their surgery, uh, one of the main things is to take care of um, the sur surgical correction and prevent a recurrence from happening. So this, these are some of my main areas of work and um, nail surgery as well. I think nail surgery is um, uh, one of the aspects of podiatry that um, hands, uh, people who love hands-on uh, really like uh, because it gives you an opportunity to do things like injections um, and then you know um, using fine instruments to remove you know the nail wedge and things like that. So um, if you're keen, you can always uh, Google or YouTube some videos about uh, podiatric nail surgery um, procedures um, if you have the stomach for it. Uh, I, I, I suppose if you are here today for health science um, scholarship seminar, you should have the stomach for it. So have a look. Um, and yeah, so this is actually my actual clinic room, the, the room that I use most often. Um, and uh, you know, the picture was taken when we were getting ready for uh, some publicity uh, campaign. So this is how people see me at work. But this is how I see myself at work. Um, as mentioned, I have a mixed portfolio. Um, I'm interested in um, getting things sorted systematically. So that includes frameworks uh, and uh, uh, protocols. Uh, at the same time, I'm also very interested in um, making things better. So um, Rather than staying status quo, I'd like to see how we can improve the way podiatrists do things, improve the, our clinical standards. So my research journey actually started when I was in NUS. So you might be surprised to hear this, but uh, I, did, I did study in NUS. Um, later on, Hody will, will talk you through the requirements to enter UniSA podiatry. Uh, so you actually do not need a degree to enter. However, if you already have a basic degree, you may have certain uh, credits. So you may, you may um, kind of like skip a certain module because you have done it before in your previous degree. So that's what I had. Um, I was hoping to fast track, but I didn't. Uh, anyway, mine was a, a three-year course 15 years ago. Um, I was hoping to fast track, but uh, because of uh, the ways the modules were run, I just had kind of a bit more free time in first year since I've done a bit of uh, the background science um, modules in NUS. So my research um, interests or experience really started in my NUS time. I was um, accepted to the Europe's Undergraduate Research Opportunities Program uh, and I did um, uh, a project in my final year in uh, biological sciences. Uh, my major was uh, biomedical science uh, and I did a minor in economics as well. So I would say that my research interest really started back then and uh, having gone through systematically with a supervisor, a whole research project from start to end uh, gave me the confidence to keep going at research. So I'm really appreciative of that. Um, and then after NUS, I went to UniSA. And uh, after I came back and worked for about three to four years, um, I thought I was out of my mind, but uh, somehow I decided to uh, do another, another, another part of studies. So I applied for, um, back then it would be, it would have been a Sing Health Scholarship. Um, and um, to do my master's locally in NTU. So I found a biomechanics um, lecturer and supervisor to take me through my master's project. Um, and the project was about a uh, foot and ankle uh, podiatry topic. So um, in, in this journey, of course, if you're in, if you're involved in uh, research publication is, is uh, it comes hand in hand. So uh, from the time I started my master's in about 2013 
till now, 2021, uh, I've published uh, probably about two to three papers a year. Um, and um, I think if you're someone interested in academic writing, uh, this would be something that you might, uh, you might love to pursue. Um, so it, the, the, the picture on the right shows an article that I published last year. It's not so much about the food per se, but it's about the communication style uh, that clinicians take uh, with our patients. And uh, the, whole, the whole idea undergirding the, the study was that our communication style will affect how the patients uh, see their conditions and how the patient would respond to um, their treatment. Uh, so um, yeah, that, that's uh, a study that I did over the past year. And in this picture, um, it's actually uh, a food cadaver, a lower limb cadaver. And uh, it's something that me and my teammates from orthopedic surgery, uh, biomechanical, uh, biomechanics engineer, um, as well as um, um, a research fellow from orthopedic uh, working on. So we're looking at how uh, joint movements can be more accurately um, um, assessed or measured. So that's what I'm currently doing at the moment. Um, if, as, as mentioned, if you are interested in academic writing, you may be interested in this career route uh, into research and, and academic. Uh, and I'm currently also contributing to the Journal of Foot and Ankle Research as a reviewer in the editorial board. So the, the Journal of Foot and Ankle Research is an internationally renowned uh, peer-reviewed journal for podiatrists and clinicians and healthcare providers interested in the foot and lower limb. So as, as promised, I'll, I'll show some pictures as well. Um, after uh, Kiran and, and Arno show their pictures, um, I think yeah, it really it really brings back good memories. And I thought uh, I should also show some of my uni pictures. So this is almost 12 or 15 years ago. Um, um, like what Ryan mentioned, there are opportunities to head outside of the city, head outside of the classroom to do more learning. So this is one of our lectures uh, in this, this, this place called House Gap. Um, these are some formal dinners and pub crawls. I'm not sure if they do pub crawls nowadays, but pub crawls was the thing back then. Um, and definitely graduation dinner. Uh, one of the things I really appreciate about my Australian experience is um, colleagues, colleagues um, from Australia who became my wider network. So I'm not I'm not only just uh, limited to Singaporean colleagues. I have a, a network of international colleagues, and Australia being a, a lot more advanced in podiatry compared to Singapore is a great network to be in. So uh, since gra graduation, I look forward to uh, go back to Australia uh, every two years uh, for the National Podiatry Conference. So in the conference, I'll meet, meet up with old friends, old colleagues, um, catch up, uh, exchange ideas. Um, I'll ask them for feedback about the things that I'm currently doing. And I must say that a lot of my career uh, progression uh, especially the research progression could not have, could not have happened without the help and contribution from my colleagues in Australia. So thank you very much. Um, so uh, I would just like to end by saying um, thank you to UniSA for starting my podiatry career on the right foot. And uh, just to close this session. Um, We'll show you a video uh, on the work of a podiatrist, and this is this was filmed um, actually in in SGH, um, and just sit back and relax and enjoy this video. We hope you enjoy, uh, and this gives you a bit of insight about what we do. Thank you. My foot hurts a lot whenever I put on my shoes. Walking long distances was also a problem. I began to worry when my first and second toes started to look a little deformed, so I decided to seek help.
Podiatry is still a young profession with much room for growth. We work in an interdisciplinary team with a common goal of resolving patients' foot conditions. Foot pain can be quite distressing, especially when it is caused by a ligament or tendon tear. In the past, I wore slim fitting shoes as I wanted to look more formal at work. However, I realised that it worsened my foot condition. Sometimes, I have to find somewhere to sit and rest my foot. Although I can carry on walking, it is still painful. Having a foot deformity is embarrassing as people ask about my toe that juts out. What affects me more is the pain that I have to bear with every day. I thought I have to live with this. When I first met Cheryl, she was in pain and worried about her foot deformity. After examination, I diagnosed her with bunion, which is a progressive bony deformity, and metatarsalgia, which is a condition where there is pain under the ball of the foot. These two conditions commonly occur together. I assessed her foot posture and walking patterns and taught her simple exercises that can help stretch the tight muscles and strengthen the weak ones. With the help of technology, I scanned her foot to customize an insole and plan an orthotic treatment to align her foot and maximize the function. Being able to be there for my patients, from diagnosing their conditions to relieving their pain, is very fulfilling. With Maribel, it's like having a soulmate to help me with my recovery. Now, I'm able to walk pain free. Thank you, Maribel. Thank you, Kiran, Arno, and Maribel for your sharing. Before we move to the Q&A segment, I'd like to invite Ms. Hodi Leong, coordinator for the International Business Development from the University of South Australia, to talk about admissions, requirements, and processes, student support and studying in elderly. Hodi, please. Thanks, Yiling. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Hodi from um, UniSA International Office. Bear with me. I'm start to share my PowerPoint. I hope everyone can see my PowerPoint clearly. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, today, I'm going to introduce our university with Actually, I think you all know about us already with um, what Ryan, Kirang, Anod, and Maribel introduced. But still, I want to give you an overall idea of our uni. So um, our uni is the biggest university in South Australia. At the moment, it's around 30, uh, 35,000 students studying with us. In that, it's around um, 6,500 students. They are from 80 different countries. So um, our nationality mix is really good. Um, for the ranking and achievements, um, we are still a very young university. At the moment, it's 30 years old. So we are one of the world's top young universities. Um, in Times and QS ranking, we ranked 25 and 29 respectively um, for those universities under 50 years old. And we rate five stars for excellence in various areas, including research, employability, teaching facilities, etc. Um, we are top 10 in Australia for both employer satisfaction and for developing work ready skills. Also, we are number one in Australia for quality education and number six worldwide, top 15 for commitment to equality and ranked 87 um, for overall university impact. As an international student um, before, so I'm very proud that our school, um, I mean, our university is very focused on students. So um, that's why we are number one in South Australia for student satisfaction. 92% um, um, of our international students feel satisfied with our service. And we are number two in Australia for student services as well. 
So for the research, we have a lot of world-class research and 100 of them, 100% of them um, are rated as world-class. And also we ranked number one in Australia for industry research income. So uh, we have 67, sorry, 76% of our academic staff hold a PhD degree. For our campuses, um, we actually got six campuses, but four of them, it's in metropolitan areas. So um, I think just now I not already show you the map and this is sort of um, the map on our brochure. So um, if you come over to study with us, you will be at City East, which is located in here. Um, and we also have another, sorry, in here, City East, and it's very close by City West, with which we got the student hub there. Um, so um, it's very convenient for the student. I just want to show you this photo, and because City East is here, City West is here, we got Wondermore, just uh, later on I'll show you the photo, and we got Chinatown very nearby, and we have a covered uh, market, which is called Adelaide Central Market. Um, you can go there and uh, have uh, buy some food, grocery things, and eat as well. Um, our campuses are um, with um, modern lecture, theatres, libraries, um, workshop studios, gym, swimming pool, etc., and also cafe, student lunches, and students can eat shop and relax at our university. So for the entry requirement, if you want to study with us uh, for Bachelor of Podiatry, we got two streams of entry requirements, so um, which is academic and English requirement. So for academic requirement, we require students at least to have um, GCA level 12 points in best three subjects, um, which is around BBB, then um, IB, if you're studying in IB, then it would be 33 for the best six subjects. Um, English requirement, if you are holding Singapore passport, so you don't really need any external English exams anymore. But um, if you're not, then um, you have to get IELTS or 7 or TOEFL 93 for or Pearson test 65 in order to come and study with us. A lot of students actually um, asking like how can they apply? So um, it's actually very easy. Uh, you can apply via either um, our registered agents in Singapore. We got nine registered agents in Singapore and you can um, actually search over Google our, or on our website. Um, agents actually help you to do all the document certification, visa application and accommodation guidance. But if you are like confident enough, you want to apply for yourself, then um, you can also apply through our uh, online system. Um, the link is over here and the web page, it's not like this if you apply with us directly. Um, other than that, we also have our um, uni scholarship, um, which from 15% to 50% throughout the four year study. So you can check on our website too. So other than introduce our university, um, Adelaide, as all the students and Ryan said, um, we are very beautiful. We are one of Australia's best kept secrets. Um, the whole, I mean, like the whole South Australia is big, but then population is relatively small compared to Singapore. So um, the whole state population is around 1.7 million. And if in Adelaide, it's around 1.3 million. Then if you go uh, from Singapore to Adelaide here, then um, we got Singapore Airline, got, um, they have direct flight, flight to Adelaide. It's around 6.5 hours, um, very convenient. And we are only one hours from Melbourne and two hours from Sydney. 
Okay, and Adelaide, very proud. Uh, we are the 10th most livable city. Um, very chill living style. You will have your own time and not so crowded compared to Singapore. And we got four seasons um, at the moment. Um, it's the end of summer time. Um, so um, autumn time is coming. Um, very pretty. We have red leaves here. So um, as what Maribel just mentioned, um, if you if you have a chance, just come to Adelaide. I believe you will love it. Um, we got a lot of festivals. Um, we call ourselves City of Festivals. Um, every year we got more than 400 festivals. Um, so um, it makes our city very busy all the time. Um, we also got a lot of outdoor dining or cafe. Um, so people are usually very enjoy the time um, to eat out or like relax uh, when having dining outdoor. Um, this is the Randall Mall, um, which I show on the map. Um, so Randall Mall is very close to our city east campus. And um, I think it's around two to three minutes walk only. Um, all the shops will be there. So it's very easy for our students to buy their necessities over there. Um, one of the very um, attractive um, point for students to study in Adelaide or live in Adelaide is because um, we have a lot of scenic beauty. We got a lot of wineries. So this is one of our wineries. Um, um, and then you can chill out in the weekend, um, drive to the winery. It's only take about 30 to one, 30 minutes to one hour there. Obviously, this is the signature koala. Um, in Australia. Um, so um, we got a lot of koala, uh, wild koala or in the zoo. So um, if you come, it is a must to see. Um, for the living course, just now, um, Kiran already like really detailed um, telling you all about the living course, but I want to just give you a big picture. So according to study Adelaide, the government um, guide. So um, Student, if for the cost of living, it's around 330 Australian dollars per week. Same dollars is around $345 per week. And you're also allowed to work part-time in Australia with your student visa. So um, if you work part-time, that it's around, which is around $20 per hour, um, you can allow to work 40 hours fortnight. So it's a good chance for you to work in Australia as well. Accommodation, I'm not just mention, uh, he's correct. We are still not having our own accommodation. Um, but then um, in a city, we have more than 50 different kinds of student accommodations for the student to choose. And we collaborate with Urbanest. Um, also, if you want to know more about the accommodation, you can go on this website and email our accommodation officers for more information. So um, thank you for your time. Um, so um, I will pass the time to Liang again um, for the Q&A section. Okay, thank you, Hody, for sharing with us more about UniSA and uh, Adelaide. So now we'll move on to the uh, Q&A segment, which is uh, together with all of our speakers. Feel free to post your questions to any of the speakers. You may want to specify who you'd like to hear from uh, if you have a question specific to a particular speaker. Unfortunately, uh, Maribel, who did her sharing earlier, wouldn't be able to join us as she has to take her leave early for another appointment, but we will still proceed with the Q&A with the rest of our speakers. So we have quite a number of uh, questions that have already uh, come in. So um, perhaps uh, Cody can address this question first because during your presentation, you talked about the entry requirement for A-level yeah. students, but actually some of our students are from diploma background, so they didn't take the GCE A-levels. So um, does UniSA actually accept uh, students from diploma background? Um, diploma background, we have to look at um, what sort of diploma. So uh, we would like to take others um, with related um, diploma 
background and uh, GPA would be um, need we need to be a bit higher. It has to be around three point two or four for okay. the entry. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Hody. Uh, would you also yeah. happen to know what is the average yearly intake of Singaporean students in the podiatry course? Sorry. Would you know like how many Singaporean students are there oh, how in many a year? Is... Yeah. Mm. Oh, um, it varies to be honest. Okay. So, um, no, I have from Ryan. It's mm. around maybe one or two students sometimes in mm. a year. Okay. So, um. To be honest, um, we are we have around three to five stu international students per okay. intake, which is okay. in February. So not a lot of um, just particularly for Singapore students, but we do okay. have other nationalities. Okay, understood. Uh, overall, I would say that the the cohort is pretty small. That's why it can vary uh, between one to four students internationally. One to four, so. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Okay, thank you, Hody. Um, I'll move on to the next question. This one, um, maybe Karen can share. Can you share some tips on how you manage to adapt in a foreign country while studying overseas? Yeah. Okay, so um, moving overseas definitely was a big jump. Uh, but I think it's helpful to know that you have to be patient as well to adjust to a different environment. Don't be too hard on yourself. It will definitely take time. Uh, but it's good to keep yourself busy when you're there. If it's very quiet, because Singapore is quite um, happening and exciting. So if you move to somewhere that is a bit quieter, it might be a bit hard to adjust. But try to keep yourself busy, find your community. For me, it was church and also climbing. Um, I think it was definitely um, helpful to have people around um, like as a support system. Um, and also, it is helpful to have a Singaporean community as well. So if you face like similar difficulties in adjusting, you guys can relate to, like, to each other on that. Okay, thank you, Karen. Uh, Arno, do you have anything to add if you still recall your student life? Yeah. <laughs> I think you're on mute, so if you're ready to answer, you can unmute yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I think like what Karen said to add on, I think it's really to keep an open mind. And I think it's more of a mindset change to really be comfortable with being uncomfortable. I think that's the okay. key. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Thank you, Arno and Karen. I think to, to echo their responses, um, when we review students who apply for scholarships who are planning to study overseas, we do look at certain qualities like being independent, uh, being able to get out of your comfort zone and whether you are able to you know, problem solve on your own because when you are studying overseas uh, as a student, you may not have the full uh, peer or family support as compared to being uh, a student in Singapore. So we are really looking at such uh, qualities in uh, students who are applying for the scholarships if you are intending to uh, pursue your studies overseas. Okay, um, the next question, maybe um, An Arnold can help to answer. So just now Maribel and yourself shared about uh, conditions that require podiatric interventions that can, uh, for example, diabetes and bunions. Um, are there any other conditions that are more common that you see uh, for patients who require podiatric treatments? Yeah, so mm -hmm. actually there are many conditions that affect the feet, not only diabetes, it's just that diabetes is the, one of the more prevalent conditions in Singapore. So other conditions would be like gout, for example, that will affect the big toe quite often. Uh, we see a lot of uh, stroke patients as well. Uh, and then there are other conditions that cause numbness and uh, other neurological deficits in the foot. So it's not only diabetes, it's a really a huge variety of conditions. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you, Arnold. Uh... We do have a number of questions coming in. Okay, perhaps for Hody, would you know whether um, students with no background in science, can they enter the course? Yeah. Um, yes, actually, we don't really need to student have any um, um, pro and we don't have any prerequisite to be honest. Yeah. So, but then we do have some, we assume that they sort of um, know some um, science related um, subject background but um, for diploma student we actually um, sort of wanting them to be like in the related um, area yeah. though yes. mm -hmm. yeah but then for GCA level and IB we won't really need that okay 
Thank you, Hody. I, I do uh, recall doc, uh, Dr. Ryan mentioning that there are some summer programs for uh, students with little or no uh, yeah. science background. We'll try to help. Yes, yeah, who can join some like bridging modules to, oh, to, to pick up their, yeah. their science knowledge before they start the course proper. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I think there is within um, things external to the program that are offered by the university, but within the program, we don't provide any specific bridging opportunities or makeup opportunities. We sit to stick to the current program as it sits. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ryan. Okay, yes. um, we have another question. So, um, with the current pandemic, I think you mentioned some uh, placements during your presentation. Um, are there any restrictions imposed to the rural placements? Yeah. Um, sorry, Ryan, you are mute. Yeah. Yeah. Are you ready to take some questions with us, Dr. Ryan? Yes. Sorry, I missed okay. that. Yes, please go yes. ahead. Okay. Yeah. So with the current pandemic, um, some of the others would like to know because you mentioned about rural placements are there any restrictions imposed because uh, they suppose that there will be some traveling involved so uh, at the moment no so interest rate travel anything mm. uh, to our rural areas is all still going ahead we do okay. have border restrictions that pop up mm. and uh, in, uh, like pop up every now and then so mm. we've had to um, change some of our opportunities in Broken Hill, but we've actually gone ahead with around about 50% of our trips. So it just keeps uh, changing with respect to the pandemic and yeah. we, mm. we will just keep flowing with it. So uh, within the, technically speaking, we always just make up them in other places. So all good. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, because um, I think Kara mentioned that she had to study remotely for quite a bit. So for students who are interested to uh, sign up and join this course, would they be studying remotely, for example, if they were to, to uh, register for the course next year, because currently the border restrictions are still in place? Yeah. Yeah, we're, def we're definitely hoping that the borders will be open by then. And obviously we're having the vaccine roll out in South Australia currently. Um, and we've, we've also been investigating opportunities to try and even get Karen in here prior to the border opening up. Um, but in, in answer to your question, if, if there was the situation where the borders aren't opened up, as you saw, a lot of our first year subjects are very much based around um, uh, sort of those preparatory courses and uh, very theoretical based. So we would be doing the same as what we did with Karen, which was just trying to create a program where she can um, study the, the things that aren't practical based, we will be trying to come up with the best opportunities to make sure she, they can continue to study them. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ryan. I think it's uh, good to know that if the students aren't able to travel to Australia for the time being, there will be alternatives available for them to pursue and continue with their studies. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'll move on to the next question for Arnold and Karen. How did you find out about podiatry? I suppose this could be something that is uh, before you joined the course. How did you find out about it? Because uh, it's quite a niche profession. Yes. And why did you choose to take up podiatry instead of other healthcare courses? Yeah. Okay, I think I'll go first. So personally, uh, my experience is exactly the same as Maribel where I was a patient and I experienced podiatry as a patient. So uh, I always wanted to work in the healthcare field. So I was actually deciding between physiotherapy versus podiatry. So in the end, I went to podiatry because it appealed to me in a sense it was more niche and it was more interesting. No offense to physiotherapy. That's a personal opinion. Uh, both disciplines are doing good, good work in, in their own aspects. So yeah, I, I, the awareness of podiatry is in fact not very high in Singapore, but that's what we are working towards because we want to work towards where like you, if for example, if you have a tooth pain, you go to a dentist and you have a foot pain, you go to a podiatrist. So I think that's what we're working on. So yeah, so long story short, I, yeah, my, I chose podiatry, I think I, I experienced podiatry as a patient, that's like Maribel. How about you, Karen? Oh, actually, it's similar as well. So, growing up, I had flat feet. So, then I went to the podiatrist in primary school to get insoles done. Um, so, that's how I first came into contact with podiatry. Um, after that, I started to, like, 
search more about it. And then I did the shadowing at one of the hospitals in Singapore. And that's when I found out about it even more. Um, I shadowed some podiatrists. And then it was there when you actually see the setting for yourself that helps you to make the decision. Okay, thank you, Anu and Karen. Okay, I think we have a few questions maybe Hody can answer. I think some of the diploma students are a bit concerned. Uh, mm -hmm. They'd like to know if you can share some examples of causes that are considered relevant for podiatry. Because you mentioned that um, it would be good for them to have some relevant background knowledge. Yeah. Yeah, relevant, that means um, diploma of health science or like health science related, that would okay. be... Right. So health science or can, uh, is it right for me to say sciences in general would be better? Um, yeah. Health science and science will be, should be also yeah. okay. Yeah, but not like yeah. business, IT, engineering. Okay. okay. For those, they will be, they will, I suppose they will uh, encounter a bit more challenge if they were to switch directly into yeah. a very uh, science heavy course like podiatry. Right. Yes. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Okay, um, we have another question, um, perhaps to Arnold and maybe Karen as well. What is your favorite part of being in podiatry? Mm, maybe, think, yeah, Arnold can go first, yeah. yeah. Mm. I think for me, it would be really the hands-on work that we do and the interaction with patients because I feel that every day will be a different work day. I, I don't sit around, I don't just sit there and do like, face a computer, I actually go around the hospital, interact with many different people, other disciplines and other patients. So uh, different patients have different personality and they all come with their own challenges. So I think the most favorite part uh, of the job would be facing a different challenge every day. In fact, facing a different challenge for every patient. I think um, I haven't really uh done much clinicals because of the pandemic so I've been in Singapore but I think I, I would expect that I would look back I look forward to the part of interacting with people in a like patient care setting yeah okay thank you Karen uh okay so I think we have a couple more questions okay uh perhaps for Arnold do you are you aware that whether there are podiatry assistant positions because you know for physiotherapies they have uh, PT assistants so um, do podiatrists have similar positions as assistants or do uh, everyone start off as a podiatrist yeah uh, yes there are designated therapy assistants working in the public hospital and they, they do work in the podiatry department as well so yes they are but not they, they don't uh, how do I put it? they do not progress to be a podiatrist yeah Okay, thank you, Arnold. Since we're on this topic, will we be able to share some of the career pathways of podiatrists? Like, uh, I think uh, Mirabel's sharing showed that uh, there's actually a huge area in research, but are there any other opportunities for AHPs like yourself to progress as they go along in the career? Yeah. yeah. So I think at the start of our careers, we really uh, gain your clinical skills, like be on the ground, gain your foundational clinical skills. And then you start progressing into different tracks. I think, yeah, yes, research is one track. Then there will be your, have your clinical track where you become a clinician, a senior clinician, so, and so forth. And then there will be the administrative like management track. And then where you, I guess you do more of the operations of running the team, managing talent. And then there will, you will have the chance also to go on to the educational track where you uh, maybe teach your juniors, maybe, I think cause podiatry now, we haven't ventured into a local university, just like the other allied health professions. So but I think there's the opportunity. So yes, the educational path is there as well. Okay, thank you, Arnold. Uh, let's see, do we have any other questions? Okay. Um, to Karen, I think um, podiatry, even though it is... Uh, it is a very niche course, so and not many universities offer it. So, a uh, member of the audience like to know why did you choose uh, UniSA among the few uh, universities that offered this course? Yeah. Okay, so mm. um, in the beginning, I was mm. also looking at this other university in uh, UK, mm. uh, but then when I did 
uh, an attachment, an attachment, um, shadowing, and mm. in the hospital. Then I was just um asking the seniors on when they went and their different experiences. So I felt like Adelaide seemed like a place that would first of all suit my personality. So then I thought that that would be a nice place to um do a uni in, um, but also uni I say because I also heard that their student support is very very strong, and um. That might not be the first thing that will come to your mind, but it really plays a big part in your journey um, as a uni student. So yes, and then after I made my choice, really no regrets because it turned out that the uni was a good place to be in. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Karen. I think from today's sharing, um, I do get the feeling that the university and the cohort is a very tight knit and close community, and pe the people there seems to be very nice and try to. Uh, help each other out and, and, and as we see from like Maribel who was a student and Dr. Ryan who has been teaching there for many years and everyone has uh, pretty good relationships even though we are working um, in separate countries so I do think that uh, from the session today it feels like UNESA does have a very strong um, support for international students yeah so um, we'll move on to the next question okay uh, yeah, so for Karen, I know you're still an undergraduate, but do you know how many clinical attachments you will have to go through during your course of study? Yeah. Okay, so in year two, which was supposed to be my year last year, um, there was uh, maybe midway into the first semester, or maybe into the second semester, people start seeing um, patients. So that is in the clinic that is in the uni itself. Um, and then later on in subsequent years, um, they will send you out to placements. I think Arnold can probably uh, confirm this. Uh, but yeah, so they will start sending you to placements. Sometimes it might be rural. I think there's one compulsory rural one. Um, and then, um, yes, Arnold, please. Yeah, okay. So I can add on. So yes, we do clinical attachments in second year where we see the patients in the university. And then moving on to year three and year four, we start having weekly clinics. So I think that's the like the very attractive point of our uni, which we we had and these weekly clinics are not only focused on like a certain area of podiatry. So in a week you actually see many different aspects of podiatry. So on um, one day you'll see your sports podiatry, the next day you will see your routine uh, general podiatry, the next day you'll see your pediatric, which is the children. And then, um, and then we also have the ad hoc trips like Ryan was did mention. So like personally, I actually went on many uh, trips. So maybe you'll spend one week in a rural area where you literally from Monday to Friday, you just see patients uh, based on their working hours. Yes, so uh, to be honest, the number of clinical attachments will vary from student to student, but, mm. the, but it's it's going to be enough for you to hit the ground running when you get back to Singapore, definitely. Okay. Uh, just want to add on, so for our course, um, at least would be 1,000 hours placement okay. throughout year two to year four. Mm. Okay. Thank you, uh, Anu and Hodi. Yeah, so I think 1,000 hours is quite a significant amount of clinical placements that you actually have to go through during your course of studies and probably it will vary uh, throughout your year two, year three, and year four, and so on. And um, as our MOHH scholarships officer, I would also like to share that we also host uh, vacation attachments for our scholars. So perhaps during like your year three or your year two um, holidays, you will actually get the opportunity to uh, come back to Singapore to do a short two to three week placements in your allocated institution to learn a bit more about the local healthcare setting and see how podiatrists actually work in uh, Singapore and apply the skills and knowledge learned back in uh, the Singapore healthcare setting. Okay, uh, we'll move on to the next question. Okay, um, this question is specifically for Arnold. Uh, was it difficult adjusting to working life in Singapore? So, and are the patient profiles different from what you learned during your course in Australia? Yeah. Mm, okay, uh, it wasn't difficult to adjust because like I mentioned just now, we actually, in our final year, we are pretty much uh, having a lot of clinical hours. Uh, in terms of patient profile, uh, to be honest, I felt more comfortable coming back to Singapore because um, 
uh, it, it feels more like home and the patients yeah. feel more relatable, to be honest. But I mean, Australia is still a multiracial uh, country where we see a huge, diverse uh, range. But in terms of podiatry, um, in terms of the feet, to be honest, the Westerners' feet are pretty different from the Asian feet. So, but don't worry, you'll still see yeah. the, the skills and the knowledge you attain from university yeah. will, will still get you by. And obviously, while you, when you start working, uh, you gain even more experience and gain even more confidence. And yeah, you just get better at it over time. Okay, thank you, Arnold. Um, I think we can take a quick break and look at uh, the following video on UniSA. Yeah, can... Can we cue the video, please? Yes. Okay, um, I think we can take another one or two questions and then we'll wrap up the session. Uh, okay, I think, um, Holdi, would you be able to share a bit more on the admission timeline? So, for example, the course, if a mm. uh, student wants to join the 2022 batch, uh, when can they start applying and roughly when would they know whether they, can, they are admitted into the course? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. if for um, our 2022 and 2023 entry, we already opened uh, for application. So students feel free to apply. But um, obviously, for example, if they're only in year 10, then um, it, we, we won't be able to um, give them an offer. So uh, mainly if you're going to graduate on the like finish your study, um, for example, in diploma or in GCA level in one year. So um, then um, you'll be able to apply with us. Okay, thank you, Hodi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Timeline would be around four to six weeks. Um, okay. you will get an offer from us. Okay, thank you, Hodi. Um, we've actually answered most of the questions. So, um, before we wrap up the session, I'd just like to ask uh, Arnold and Karen as well as Hodi, um, do you have any last words of like advice for aspiring students who, who want to join podiatry and or, or study at UniSA? Yeah, maybe Hodi, you like to go first. Yeah. 
Um, so if for um, our university, because um, we are very um, famous for uh, rehab related programs. So obviously podiatry is one of them. And also just now and not talk about physiotherapy or occupational therapy, speech therapy, we are relatively new um, in for, um, it's only, st uh, we only have that um, in 2019. So, um, so um, basically if the students study with us in podiatry, you will not just um, in podiatry, but you will work with different streams um, of colleagues or students. Um, you will get to know um, everyone and um, our student support as well. It's very good because um, our uni not having a lot of international students, we still can support a lot of uh, international students. So um, that's for me. Okay, thank you, Hody. Uh, maybe Karen, you can go next. Okay, so um, maybe not so much last words, but I think yeah. I would encourage people yeah. to come and join UniSA okay. because of the good experience I personally have had. Yeah. Uh, and also that um, it's not just the uni, but where the uni is, the, this state and this city is a great place to be. So yeah. Okay. Thank you, Karen. How about Arno? Okay, so I will actually encourage people to join podiatry. And of course, go to UNSA. But in terms of podiatry in Singapore, uh, we definitely need more people. I think we are only having about 100 podiatrists in Singapore. And we have a lot of patients to see. So we definitely uh, need more podiatrists. But I think one thing is that if you're interested, please do find out more about podiatry because we do deal with a lot of... Uh, what, uh, not what people say gory stuff in terms of diabetic food ulcers. So yes, definitely do find a chance to shadow or you know even Google it. See whether you are comfortable with dealing with blood, uh, meat, uh, because you'll be going, you're, you'll be using your own hands to clean up mm. and uh, manage all these uh, diabetic food ulcers. So definitely go go read up more about it and experience first first hand. So but podiatry is definitely a rewarding career mm. to embark on. And yes, MOHH would be the most ideal uh, platform to actually yeah. get on to podiatry. Okay. Yeah, that's all from me. Okay, thank you, Arno, Karen, and Hody. Yeah, just to continue from what uh, Arno shared, so uh, podiatry is a course that is not being offered in Singapore. So um, because of the expenses that you may have to incur in an overseas studies, perhaps uh, a healthcare scholarship may be the best option for you if you're looking to uh, pursue a podiatry study overseas. And um, we do have an increasing demand for podiatrists in Singapore. So if you're interested in healthcare and you would like to pursue a career that can make a difference, do check out the podiatry profession and research and find out more before um, deciding whether you want to go for the course. Yeah, so um, even though we are slightly ahead of time, I would like to uh, end off today's session by saying thank you, especially to the guest speakers all the way from University of South Australia, um, Hody and Dr. Ryan, as well as our podiatrists, uh, Maribel and Arnold and Karen, for taking time out of their busy day to join us. Um, I'm sure the audience has benefited from your insightful sharing. So we have come to the end of this session. Um, to the audience, if you have enjoyed this session, please take a few seconds to rate this program at the bottom left of your screen. So our next session, The Future of Allied Health and the Vital Roles They Play, is happening tomorrow at 2 p.m. Here from the Uni uh, National University Health Systems, uh, NUHS, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, and diagnostic radiography professionals as they share more about their healthcare journey. We look forward to seeing you at our upcoming sessions. Go on and have fun as you learn to dare to care in our online webinars and virtual activities. Thank you once again. Have a good evening ahead. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.